Risk management is one of the core skill sets within the wider profession of project management. Whether your project is purely predictive or absolutely agile, you will need to manage risk. I've made plenty of specialist videos on this topic, but this one is your basic introduction. First, what are risk and risk management? Risk is defined simply as uncertainty that can affect the outcome. Risk is therefore something that can happen and the consequences could be either good or bad. Typically, we talk about opportunities for risks which have a positive outcome and threats for risks which have a negative outcome. Risk management is the process of managing that uncertainty and controlling the impacts of the risk on your project. Within risk management, we find three things a set of tools, processes, and attitudes. The basic risk management process has four steps. First, we identify the risk, then, we analyze it. Next, we put together a plan for how we'll manage it. And finally, we take action. And then, having taken action, we analyze to see whether the action we've taken has been sufficient to properly control the risk. If it hasn't, we figure out why not. We put together a new plan and we take more action. And we continue to cycle around until we consider that any remaining risk is completely acceptable. We identify project risks by trying to figure out everything that could possibly go wrong, because usually we're focused on threats. However, if you want to look at opportunities too, you can also think about everything that is uncertain, which could be beneficial if it happens. There are many different ways to identify risks, and we have a whole video on that. When it comes to analyzing risks, we usually focus on two things. And these are the two things that define a risk. A risk is uncertainty that can affect outcome. So therefore, the first thing we look at when we analyze risk is the level of uncertainty, the likelihood that the risk will happen. This can be anywhere between zero and one. Obviously, a zero likelihood risk can't happen, so it's not a threat or an opportunity. Equally, something with a likelihood of one will certainly happen. That's not a risk, it's an issue if it's negative, and it's a benefit if it's positive. Scoring the likelihood of a risk is very difficult, and therefore I always advocate that you keep it simple. Low, medium, and high likelihood is a perfectly good scale for most projects. And even for more sophisticated projects, you'll rarely need anything more than very low, low, medium, high, and very high because you simply do not have the sophistication in your statistics understanding nor the data to give anything more of a quantitative or precise definition of the likelihood of your risk. And since a risk is uncertainty that can affect the outcome, the other important element of our analysis is what is that effect, and we talk about that as the impact. What can happen and how serious is it? We often score the impact on some sort of a scale, again, from low to medium to high. And there are lots of ways to do it, but once again, keeping it simple is usually a good start. For those who want to be more sophisticated, the next obvious step in the analysis is to also bring in the idea of proximity, because some risks, if they are going to happen, are going to happen soon. Others, if they're going to happen, it's going to be a long time in the future. Clearly, the risks might be equally likely to happen with equally serious consequences, but we don't need to act in such a hurry with a risk that is going to happen, if it does, a long way in the future. So, if we've identified a risk, and let's say for the sake of argument that it's a serious risk with high level of consequences, a high level of likelihood, 
had a fairly imminent impact if it does happen, what can we do about it? Well, there are six core strategies. First, we can try to eliminate the risk entirely, which of course is the gold standard, but equally, it's often very hard to find a single way to fully eliminate the risk without doing the project or a significant part of the project. The next strategy is to reduce the likelihood that it will happen. Do something to make it less probable. Our third strategy, if we can't do those, or if we can and we want to do something else, is to reduce the impact. If it does happen, to make it less serious. The next strategy is to try to transfer some or all of the risk so that the impact affects someone or something else rather than your project. The commonest examples of this are insurance products, which transfer the financial element of a risk, or contracts, where the contractor takes on the risk on your behalf as part of the contractual arrangement. The next strategy is to put in place a contingency plan. This won't make the risk any less likely to happen and it won't make it any less bad if it does, but now you will have a plan for how to manage it in the moment so that you can reduce the ongoing impact. And the sixth strategy is to accept the risk. If the risk is not very large, if it's not very serious, if it's not very likely, then you may consider that none of the other strategies are cost effective and to accept the risk and deal with it if it occurs. Now, I am aware that PMI introduced a seventh strategy, that of escalating the risk to a higher level of authority. But for me, all that is, is offering the same six strategies to somebody else. It's not a new strategy, it's just an expedient based on the management structures to my way of thinking. So what are the key tools and templates that we use in risk management? There are two or three. The first or the first two are the risk management plan. And I say that this could be two different tools because the term risk management plan is used in two different ways. When I learned project management and risk management, I was taught that a risk management plan is the plan you put in place to manage a particular risk. So when you've got a large substantial risk, which can have a big impact, you might put together a whole plan for how to handle it. And I have a video on how to create a risk management plan. However, PMI, in its guide to the project management body of knowledge, uses the term risk management plan to represent the plan for how you are going to manage risk on your project. Both uses are equally valid. Both tools or templates are equally important and valuable to your project. If only we had two different terms for each of them. The second key tool that we use on risk management is the risk register. And I have a whole video on how to create a risk register. Sometimes called a risk log, a risk register is a tool that serves two principal purposes. Firstly, it is a management tool. We record all of our risks and all of the information about them on our risk register so that we can actively manage those risks and track our progress. It's the tool we use to identify which risks we haven't addressed recently, and so we can turn our attention to them and do something about them. It's also the tool that we record the progress on. The second use of a risk register is that it is a document of record. It is where we record diligently all of the risks we've identified and the actions we're taking to make the process transparent. It is part of our due diligence. It is part of the governance of the project. As a result, the risk register is one of the key tools that shows you are acting responsibly as the project manager. If you or your team members identify a risk, you need to put it on the risk register and document your assessment of it and what you expect to do about it. 
you won't be wrong if you make an informed judgment and it turns out that your informed judgment is incorrect. But you will be wrong if you don't make an informed judgment or you can't demonstrate that you did. So risk management is a process that every project manager needs to understand. And it's a process that some project managers will choose to go into deeply. If you do want to go into it deeply, then most large project management organizations have specific risk management training and qualifications. The PMI, the APM, and the Axelos organization, which is responsible for PRINCE2, all have their own methodologies and certificated exams. And if you want more of my thinking on risk management, then I have a book called Risk Happens, which is available in its second edition from Amazon, and I will put a link in the description. Of all the disciplines under the umbrella of project management, risk management is one of the most important. If you've enjoyed this video, I have loads more about the details of risk management, and I will put a playlist in the description. You cannot manage your project risks until you know what it is that you need to manage. So in this video, let's look at the different ways that you can identify the risks in your project. This video is sponsored by Risky Project. Risky Project is a complete suite of project risk analysis and project risk management software. It integrates with all major scheduling and planning tools and covers the complete risk management lifecycle. We often start our risk management process with a risk management kickoff workshop. And when this is facilitated well, it can be both productive and fun. But frankly, too often project managers stick to just one favorite method for identifying risks. And the commonest of those it's brainstorming. So let's start with brainstorming, but let's learn how to do it right. After that, we'll see why it's not really that great and how to take it up a notch to fix some of the problems. But best of all, I've got five other approaches for identifying project risks that are all favorites of mine and all of which I've used in risk identification workshops. Let's start with brainstorming. In brainstorming, we invite the whole team to contribute ideas without limitation, and we get them onto a board. And to do this right, we probably need to be very clear about what it is we want, and we also need to be clear that there is initially to be no discussion of the ideas. If someone's had an idea, we record it. And then once we've recorded all the ideas, we can start to sift them, sort them, organize them, and then evaluate them. However, brainstorming is not without its problems. And perhaps for me, the biggest of them is managing a large group. There is so much energy in the room if you do it well, that you may not be able to capture all of the ideas. What this then tends to mean is that some louder voices will dominate. They will just capture your attention. But even if it's not a large group, the simple fact is that some individuals are more assertive, more dominant than others. And indeed, the group may defer to certain individuals. Therefore, they can introduce a small but important bias. Their ideas frame the risks that other members of the group start to identify. They can funnel the team down a relatively narrow path. So we have these two major problems, the large amount of information that is coming at you and how to manage it. And secondly, the contamination of my ideas by your ideas. Both of these can be overcome by my second technique, brain writing. Brain writing allows much more parallel processing of ideas. Everyone is contributing their ideas simultaneously, which means it is ideal for very large groups as well as small groups. 
It also overcomes the bias because people are working on their ideas on their own without hearing and therefore being influenced by the ideas of people around them. So how does it work? Brain writing starts by giving everybody a handful of blank cards. You set up the scenario and then you ask everyone to contribute their ideas by putting one idea on each card and using as many cards as they wish. What I typically have people do is to throw their cards when they've completed them into the centre of the table or into a bowl or a bucket of some sort. This way you can get many, many ideas developed in parallel. The next thing to do is something that is harder to do with brainstorming, which is to develop those ideas. In fact, the first stage of the developing of those ideas is to see if any of those ideas trigger new ideas for new risks. You randomly hand out a number of the cards to each person in the group and ask them in a fixed amount of time to look at the cards and to develop the ideas. If they can think of another risk triggered by that idea, they can write that down on a new card. If they can see a way to manage that risk or want to articulate a development of the idea of what that risk is, to specify it more or to explain it, they can add it to the card. With a number of rounds of this brain writing, you end up with a large number of cards or with a lot of developed ideas. The only real downside is that in this process, we may well have some overlap of work because people will be working on cards with the same idea. However, there are ways to overcome that and there are worse problems than having too many ideas and some overlap between them. But beyond brainstorming and brain writing, I have five other ideas for how you can identify the risks. And the first is horizon scanning. Horizon scanning is looking out to the horizon of the project and looking for the spectres of risks to come. And I purposely use the word spectres because that provides us with a handy acronym, a mnemonic to help us remember eight common sources of project risk. So we can look out to the boundaries of our project and ask what risks are there that arise from social interactions or the interaction between the project and society or what sociological risks are there? Next, we can ask what political risks are there and remind the group that we're not just talking about capital P politics, national or regional politics or even global politics. We're also talking about the small P politics. The fact that when you have two people in a room, you have politics. The first E of spectres stands for economics. And once again, we've got capital E economics the macroeconomics of the, the region, the country or the world when the project is in operation. But we've also got the project economics, the financial considerations around the project itself. Related to this is C for commercial risks. And what are the risks in terms of procurement, competition, other aspects of the commercial context within which the project sits? The T stands for technology. What are the technology risks that could impact our project? And then the R stands for regulation. What are the regulatory or legislative risks to your project? What regulation can change? What legislation do you have to comply with that if you don't comply with it, your project could get into trouble? The second E stands for environmental risks. And once again, we've got the macro environment, the global environment, if you like, but we've also got the local environment, the immediate environment of the project. And finally, S stands either for security risks or for safety risks. These are the threats that can harm us directly. You can use the Spectre's mnemonic in two fundamental ways. One, you can work through it systematically on your own or with a group of people. Or secondly, 
as your group of people are working through one of the other approaches to finding risks for your project, you could prompt them with, are we missing any political threat? Are we missing any economic threat? Are you missing any societal threat or any regulatory or legislative effects? My next risk identification method is a risk database. As a project manager, you should always be keeping a record of the risks identified and the risks realized on your project and gradually build up a database of common threats that you encounter. If you've got a standard list of risks and my project checklists pack has one, I'll put a link in the description. If you have a standard list of project risks, then you can use that as a great starting point for identifying risks that are applicable to your project and contextualizing the wording around them. Next is the idea of a risk breakdown structure. A risk breakdown structure is a hierarchical decomposition of all the things that can go wrong on your project. So the first thing to start with is the top level categorization. And there are a number of ways that people do this. Certainly, you can divide your project up by stages or phases, and you can also divide it up by the chunks of work, but we'll look at that in a moment. Commoner ways are to start with a framework, such as, for example, spectres. You could start with eight major sources of risk and then break each of those down. Another framework that is commonly used is time, cost, quality, and scope. And another one is people, processes, strategy, and technology. Once you have a high level framework, you can then start to break each one down and ask what are the risks in that particular area of concern. My next approach is one I've already hinted at, which is to start with your work breakdown structure. And this can work equally well whether you use a task based work breakdown structure or a product based work breakdown structure. For each element of work or each product, ask yourself what are the risks to completing that work or to delivering that product. If you need help on knowing how to develop a work breakdown structure, then I have a video to help you, which I'll put a link in the description. But critically here, the benefit to this is that you can now link your risk register directly to your work breakdown structure, your work breakdown structure dictionary. Each risk can have a unique reference number which extends your work breakdown structure. My final technique is the pre mortem, which was developed by Gary Klein and documented in his fantastic book, The Power of Intuition. I'll put a link in the description. We have a full video on the pre mortem, but in essence, it invites the group not to think about what can go wrong, but to imagine the project has come to its end and it has gone wrong. Everything has gone wrong. It's a complete and utter disaster, a fiasco. And then to ask the people what might have caused that. This looks for substantial risks, not just risks to your plan, but things that can existentially threaten the whole project. And then you invite people to work back through a chain of effects to causes and identify the risks to your project. Once you've identified your risks, the next step is to get them onto your risk register or into your risk database or some other risk management tool. We have a video on risk registers, but of course, this is where our sponsor, Risky project can come in. So if you need a sophisticated risk management tool, take a look at the link in the description. In this video, I want to answer the question, what is a pre-mortem? And explain how to conduct one. The pre-mortem is a technique devised by Gary Klein in his excellent book, the power of intuition, and I'll put a link to it in the description. It's certainly well worth reading. Klein named the pre-mortem as an analogy to the idea of a post-mortem, in which we examine a corpse after death 
to find out why it died. What, he asks, would happen if we could examine a project before it dies to find out the reason for its potential death? That's the principle of the pre mortem. Foreseeing the failure of a project and identifying the causes before they happen. The pre mortem is an excellent exercise that you can carry out at any time during the course of your project as part of your risk management process. But of course, the best time to carry it out, and certainly the first time you should carry it out, is right at the start of your project. And it also makes a fantastic exercise to use in a team kickoff meeting. The pre mortem is a way to find failings in your plan, but too often when we look for risks, we take the plan as our core assumption and look for small things that could go wrong based on the plan. What the pre mortem does is it sweeps aside your plan and says, what could go wrong? regardless of what the plan is. The problem is that we have an intrinsic bias. Once we've created our plan, it's very hard for us to see anything happening that is not fundamentally based on that plan or a variant on it. The universe, however, has no such bias. So while we find it hard to escape the tunnel vision that the broad path of our plan lays out for us, there may be some fundamental assumptions embedded in our plan that are simply wrong. The pre mortem exercise allows us to find these major divergences because it doesn't start from the plan, it starts from the assumed failure of your project. Kicking off the pre mortem exercise, we start by inviting people to assume that the project completion has been an utter and complete fiasco. So let's look at how to conduct a pre mortem. And this process can work equally well as a live in person event with everybody in a room or as an online facilitated event with your team scattered all over the world. I'll break it down into six steps. Step one is preparation. Gather together your group and set up the exercise. Make sure everybody understands the basic nature of the project and that everybody has a pen and paper available to them. Step two is to imagine a fiasco. Invite everyone to imagine the end of the project and to imagine that it has gone seriously wrong. Ask them to think about the different ways in which it may have failed and what those outcomes look like. Get them to note down the different types of failure that they've identified. When everyone's documented the failures they've identified, then get the group to share them and put them on a board so that everyone can see the different scenarios that you're looking at. Step three is to generate reasons for the different failures. Ask your group to write down everything that they can think of that may have caused or contributed to the failures that they've identified as a group. Step four, consolidate the lists. Now facilitate a sharing session that compares the failures and the reasons for the failures. Capture these on a board and keep facilitating to add to the list, to organize it and to develop it until you've got everybody's ideas. Step five, review your risk register and your plan. Take all the work you've done and look for new risks to add to your risk register and elements of your plan that need to be strengthened or completely rewritten. Finally, at step six, end the session by determining what the next steps are and allocating responsibilities for them. Periodically come back and repeat the exercise to keep your team alert for new reasons for possible failures and therefore to keep your plan as sharp as possible. 
The risk management process is straightforward. We identify our risks, we understand them, and then we put together a plan before taking action. But how do we put together a risk management plan? The first step in developing a risk management plan is to clarify what the risk is. We need to characterize it, describe it, and evaluate it in terms of its impact, its likelihood, and its proximity. Secondly, if we're going to manage and mitigate the risk, we need to understand the causes of that risk. What are the root causes and the sequence of events which will trigger the risk to materialize? The better we understand the causal sequence that will lead up to the risk happening, the better we can design interventions that will address it as early as possible. Thirdly, if we can, the best thing to do is to split one risk into lots of smaller sub-risks, the components. Particularly if you describe a risk in a loose way like financial cost overruns. That's actually the sum total of many, many financially related risks. It's hard to manage and mitigate cost overruns, but it's much easier to manage the individual causes. Identify those as individual risks and then move to step four. For each risk, determine which strategic responses are likely to be most successful. And for big risks, you're going to want to combine two, three, or even more strategic approaches in your response to that risk. Of course, those strategic responses are to eliminate the risk, to reduce its likelihood, to reduce its impact, to transfer the risk, to build a contingency plan, or to accept the risk and do nothing. Now, for each of the strategies you're going to use, you need to determine the tactics the detailed approach will take to delivering that strategy. Evaluate your options and document the best of them. So at number six, you need to write up your action plan for the risk. This will include what you intend to do, the timing or schedule for your actions, who will be responsible and the resources that they'll need, the people, the assets, the equipment and the materials, what will be your budget? How much are you going to spend remediating the risk? And what are the review points along the way so that you can check that the actions you are taking are having the intended effect? And when you've done that, number seven is to determine the residual risk. Does your management plan address the whole risk? If it doesn't, what is left? And how much of a threat is that? And if a residual risk remains, then step eight is to document your contingency plans that you can put into action if any of that residual risk is materialized. So the process for creating a risk mitigation plan is straightforward. I've broken it down into eight steps, and those are steps that you can follow very easily for each risk in your risk register. And if you need to know more about risk registers, then take a look at this video. Of all the tools and templates available to us as project managers, there's only one that I consider to be absolutely mandatory. If you're putting someone else's money at risk, if you're hazarding their reputation, you need to be clear that you can demonstrate that you've acted with diligence and appropriate caution in guarding their reputation and managing their money. And for that, the tool you need is a risk register or a risk log. So in this video, I want to talk about how to construct a robust risk register and the fields you can expect to have in it. Before I start talking about the fields that I'd put in a risk register, I have to say that this is a long list. It's a list of all of the core fields I would expect in a big risk register for a big project. 
That is to say, if your project is a small project, you may not need all of these fields and it is far better to have a smaller, simpler risk register where you consistently fill in all the fields that are there than to have a big complex risk register and you don't use it properly. So configure your risk register to meet your needs. You may not need all of these fields. The other thing to say before I dive straight in is that I'm going to divide this into four sections. Each section represents a stage in the risk management process. And I'm going to use a basic four stage life cycle of identifying your risks, analyzing your risks, planning your risk management approach and taking action. So part one of your risk register will refer to identifying the risks and the very first field and an absolutely mandatory field, I would say, is a unique ID or reference number for each risk because one of the purposes of a risk register is to act as a document of record and audit trail. And therefore, each risk needs a unique ID. Allocate it when you identify the risk and add it to the risk register. And if for any reason you take a risk off or you change the risk substantially, then delete it, but retain the unique ID and never reuse that identifier. The risk IDs can be a sophisticated thing linked to perhaps a work breakdown structure or a risk breakdown structure, or it could be a simple numeric one, two, three, four, five, which is my preferred approach. It keeps things nice and simple. And I tend to use leading zeros and give myself plenty of space just to make things nice and neat for when I'm sorting. The next thing you may want to consider is the originator of the risk, the person who first identified the risk. Why would you record that? Well, because if in recording the risk, you use some shorthand that you understand at the time and then later you're not exactly sure what the nature of that risk is. You know who to go back and ask to get clarification. By the way, the originator of the risk is not necessarily the person who is responsible for managing it. It's simply the person who recognizes that risk at the first time and causes it to be on the risk register. Another thing I'd say is once a risk is identified, it needs to go on the risk register. If for any reason you say, no, 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 let's not put that on the risk register. Then what happens if that risk really does materialize? Someone will remember that you chose not to put it on the risk register and therefore not to actively manage that risk. And now you become culpable. Next, I'd have a short description or title for the risk. This is a shorthand description that can display easily. As a result, it won't be a full description of the risk, so you will need another field for that long form or full description. And let this be a full narrative field that can accept a large amount of text. The more carefully and precisely you define the risk, then the easier it is to find an appropriate response to that risk. The next part of your risk register is about analyzing the risks. And the first field you might want in this is some form of risk categorization. This may be linked to the work streams and the work breakdown structure, or it may be linked to a set of standard categories you use in your organization. For example, political risks, economic risks, social risks, technological risks, regulatory risks, environmental risks, security, safety risks. A lot of people like to characterize risks, but the question I always ask is having categorized your risk, what will you do with that information? Will it affect anything about how you handle the risk? And if the answer is no, then nice though it may be to be able to sort your risks into categories, it may not be worth the effort of defining those categories. Next and crucially is some form of evaluation of the risk. You may just have a single field here with a high, medium or low, but it may be that you want something more sophisticated than that. 
And the main components of risk evaluation are firstly impact. And this may be a numerical assessment of impact or again a high, medium or low type of assessment. The next thing is some form of likelihood. And unless you really know what you're doing with statistics and probability theory, I would keep this simple, high, medium and low, or possibly very high, high, medium, low and very low. And you may want to have some sort of proximity measure to recognize that a risk that could happen in the very near future, tomorrow or the day after, is one we're going to give more attention to than one that will happen in the way distant future in a year or two years time. And you may want a field with some form of consolidated risk score. Again, severe or not severe, high, medium or low, red, amber or green, or one, two or three. Doesn't matter what scoring mechanism you use, because again, unless you understand the mathematics of this really deeply, you want to be sticking to a mechanism that allows you to make decisions and not to drive quantitative evaluation. The third part of your risk register is about planning. And of course, you're going to have a field for your risk management plan. In fact, you may choose to have multiple fields for a plan with multiple components, different ways of mitigating the risk. If the risk is a higher likelihood risk and a higher impact risk, then one single mitigating action may not be enough. You may need a whole series of actions based on different strategies. Therefore, you may need several fields to hold this. Next, for each component of your plan, you need an owner or ideally one owner across the whole plan to take responsibility for managing that risk so that it's less of a threat. Avoid the temptation as project manager to make yourself owner for too many risks because you'll have no one to chase and you probably won't have time to manage them all. Work stream leaders, team leaders are ideal people to be owners for substantial risks and experts and functional operatives are ideal for smaller, lower profile risks. The other fields to have under planned are planned dates. And in particular, a field for the next planned review of the risk to evaluate the progress made on each of the, uh, on each of the mitigation plans and to review your evaluation of the risk. And you may set a date for plan closeout, the point at which the risk is no longer a threat to the project. This is a target date for planning purposes and can be very useful. The fourth part of your risk register is all about action. And the first set of fields I'd have are about progress. So you would have a narrative field for status of that risk and progress on managing the plan. And against that status would be a date. Finally, I'd have a section of your risk register for risk closure. Again, there would be a status. Has the risk gone away? Is it no longer a threat? Has it been managed out? Has it ceased to be a threat? For natural reasons, has it materialized and been dealt with? What's the status of the risk? And the date at which it ceased to be a threat. So a good risk register will have a number of fields, but it won't have any fields that you don't need to properly manage the risk. But crucially, a risk register is a document of record. It's part of your audit trail. It is also one of the most valuable management tools you'll have as a project manager. So create a good, well-structured risk register at the start of your project, use it effectively, and you will find your project is under greater levels of control, greater levels of governance, and therefore it's more likely to deliver on budget, on schedule, and to specification. Please do give us a thumbs up if you like this video. I'm going to be producing loads more great content, so please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you don't miss any of that content. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.